This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. In Nicosia last week, experts gathered at a conference entitled Is Climate Change a Threat to Tourism? to address the issues faced by the tourism sector with regard to climate change. I spoke to several of the keynote speakers, so this week's programme is all about tourism and sustainability. We have proposed for many years uh, plans for adaptation to severe extreme events, but normally the politicians don't take action unless they see the danger actually approaching. Our grandparents, they didn't travel to the extent that we're traveling today, so we have seen a big increase and yeah, you start wondering if we can continue like this and then you look at the emissions that tourism is causing up to 12% if you look at the global scale and then you just know the answer. We cannot continue like this, so we, we need a change in tourism. We believe that the changes uh, which we have done will give the chance to the travel industry to bring more uh, clubs in preparation in Cyprus. We have a special labeling when you book a holiday so you, you can see what, what kind of hotel you have and we see people booking that. But of course it's always a combination of different factors. One is of course sustainability. Christos Yanakopoulos is from the National Observatory in Athens and he was talking at that Climate Sustainability and Tourism Conference about the impact that global warming will be having, not just in the tourism sector. But Christos, you were dealing with the tourism sector, obviously, because that's what the conference was concentrating on, shall we say, and it's quite frightening. You had a lot to say about how things are going to change. Can you encapsulate them for me? Yeah, it is a multidimensional uh, sector tourism, so it encompasses more than one impact. So if we think about the impacts of climate change on the tourist as a human person, then we need to think about the human comfort or discomfort of a tourist, and we need to think about health issues, uh, such as if he's going to be bitten by unknown species of mosquitoes or by strange diseases when he comes to a different place. Uh, so, uh, if we think about the tourism product, then we need to think about the natural environment uh, that a tourist is going to find in a place that he visits. Uh, so, for example, if uh, the natural environment has been destroyed by wildfire, then a tourist might not prefer to come to a destination altogether. Uh, or if there is a, a substantial sea level rise, then there might be a lot of beach loss. Uh, so a tourism, tourist also might be uh, reluctant to come to such a place. Uh, similarly, the tourism industry uh, might also need to consider the extra energy that we'll need for cooling uh, the hotels uh, because uh, climate scenarios anticipate that the future is going to be much warmer, especially in the warm period of the year. Yeah, you showed some maps with lots of very dark red areas in Cyprus. I was interested that you seem to think that the eastern area of the island is probably the most vulnerable to great temperature rise. Yes, Why? the east, uh, because you can say that this area was more protected from the effects of weather. So it was more sheltered, so it had the best climate, the, the longest summer, or uh, very quiet seas, but this in, in, in terms of climate change means that it's going to have more effects, more rising temperature, and the rising temperature is going to be in the warmer period of the year, so, so that is going to make this area more of a hot spot, you can say, in the island of Cyprus. Uh, but if you consider the wildfires, then the mountainous area of Cyprus is also very vulnerable. And the mountainous area is where you have all the green parts in Cyprus, because this is the area where you concent the Cyprus concentrates all the forests that it has. So uh, with the risk of wildfire being greater in these areas, 
you might risk losing also these areas. And of course, if the trees burn down, then we have less carbon absorption, and so we're correct, going correct. higher this and higher. This is the other the issue, the issue of mitigation to climate change, which is not a local issue. It has to be done on a global basis. But of, of, for example, but uh, if, if a lot of uh, forests are destroyed, then, uh, as you say, there's going to be uh, more CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. And a warmer climate. Warmer climate. We've already heard tourists who visited this year, and we had a pretty hot summer, mm -hmm. saying, can't do this again, it's unbearable, I'm going further north next year, I've been coming to Cyprus for years but I'm not coming back at this time of year. Now that also brings to mind the fact that possibly the tourism season may change. The tourism season may change. Of course, uh, tourists might not prefer to come in the hottest months of the year, like July and August. There is a possibility, and there is much of a possibility that the tourist season is going to be extended in terms of weather. But the thing is, if families are able to come in Cyprus, for example, the weather in Cyprus might be excellent in October. But a family with kids who are at school, can they spend uh, 15 days in Cyprus uh, when the schools in North Europe are open? Can they come as a family here? They might not be able to come physically. Do you see this so having an impact on our whole way of life? I mean, what you've just said suggests to me that if it really does get that bad, then possibly they change the school year in Europe so that they the big holiday they? is at a time when people can go away. But uh, that might be a problem for North Europe because, you know, in North Europe the summers become better. So why not the North European countries benefiting from tourist flows in July and August? So why should they change their school holidays since they could benefit? Because a person in Holland might prefer to go, for example, to France, to the north of France, facing the Atlantic to do holidays, perfect holidays in July and August, and not come to Cyprus. Why, why should they change that? I don't, I don't see why. It's the same in Greece, isn't it? We've got a similar problem, and that is that we have put a lot of energy and effort into the tourism product, and it's a very important part of our GDP. Correct. And have we taken on board yet all these things that you've been talking about to see if there's anything we can do? Have you come up with any plans or suggestions about what should be done? Well, we always come up with, as scientists with plans and uh, adaptation possibilities to the tourism industry. We present these to the regular authorities, but I, I am not sure that it has actually become into a practical effect. Uh, so all the things that we have proposed as adaptation measures, also for flooding, because you know in Greece we had the serious flooding, we have proposed for many years uh, plans for adaptation to severe extreme events. But normally the politicians don't take action unless they see the danger actually approaching and they saw it this year, so they might take action now, but before they actually see it, uh, you can see much less action. It's always, it seems to me, reactive rather than proactive. Yes, and correct. if we're going to win the climate war, we have you to be need, proactive. You have to be proactive. But uh, here it's also the importance of the tourism industry because the tourism industry is in a way global. And if they decide to do actually something, like to promote uh, less CO2 emissions in the hotel industry as a whole, then we might see something changing in climate as well. And in in, this is not local measures, it's more global because the tourism industry is not anymore uh, localized or regionalized. No, but you work, I know, very closely with the Cyprus Institute Correct. who've been doing climate maps for years. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about it many times, but I'm wondering how much coordination there is across the globe between scientists and researchers. We say that the Mediterranean is a hot spot, it certainly is, but are there other areas and should we be getting together to try and make some sort of global plan? I think in terms of science there is collaboration and I mention collaboration because 
at least in Europe, uh, we are very lucky to have EU projects that bring a lot of research institutes together. So we have the possibility uh, to exchange views and ideas and to see also projections, climate projections and maps in other countries, in other regions of Europe. So I would say that in Europe at least there is a lot of uh, potential or already existing collaboration in scientific way. But also in a global sense uh, I see that there are a lot of efforts. For example the IPCC is a global initiative and brings uh, scientists together from around the world who write these assessments. It's not as strong as, for example, in Europe, but um, I think in science we, we, there is no problem of collaboration. <laughs> we certainly hope not, and we need the politicians, of course, to listen to the scientists, okay. don't we? That is Christos Yanagopoulos from the National Observatory of Athens, telling us there about the impact of climate change, particularly on our tourism. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. My next guest was another speaker at that conference on sustainability and tourism. Elke Dens is Director of Global Programs at the Travel Foundation. Elke, I was interested that you pretty well started your talk with It's Time for Change. So please elaborate on that. Yes, I think it's time for change and especially a change in tourism because tourism has been growing so fast uh, if you look at the last 20, 30, even 40 years, you might remember that our, our grandparents, they didn't travel to the extent that we are traveling today. So we have seen a big increase and yeah, you start wondering if we can continue like this. And then you look at the emissions that tourism is causing up to 12% if you look at the global scale. And then you just know the answer. We cannot continue like this. So we we need a change in tourism. What sort of change do you have in mind? You talked about grandparents. Back then, they maybe got into the car or on the local train and went to the nearest seaside resort. That was it. Correct. I can't see us going back to that somehow because people seem to think that travel abroad these days is the thing to do. Yes, correct. Uh, I, and I think uh, it's, it will be very difficult to, to ask something of people to change what they have taken for granted almost. But we can, I think, ask people to not consider tourism as a, as a commodity. And, and that sometimes also happens today or like a normality, like we, we just assume that going three times a, a year on a holiday, like a small city trip and then a longer holiday during summer and then an additional ski trip maybe, as normal. And maybe we can ask people to rethink this pattern. Have you said that to a lot of people in the travel business? You are the Travel Foundation. What do they think? They're going to see the numbers of customers drop dramatically, aren't they? Well, yes, and it's, it's not an easy story to tell, but I think it all starts with the question, can we continue like this? And, and also for the businesses in tourism, I think there are opportunities of looking differently at tourism while even growing profit numbers. So I think we have been driven by volumes. And if you look at the tourism sector economically, it's really depending on a high volume. And if we could change that, and if we could really make sure that businesses in tourism stay profitable, but not so much by the number of people, but by attracting the right people or reducing costs, or you know, just looking at the business model a bit different, we might also open up some new pathways to discover new kind of tourism that can still be beneficial, also economically. New pathways, but you talk about fewer numbers, and we are always talking here in Cyprus about quality tourism, and that tends to be more expensive, and everybody's struggling at the moment to even go on a cheap package holiday. Yeah, well, 
I don't know everybody. I think there's a specific type of visitor that is very price sensitive. But again, maybe they go not only once, but three times a year on a holiday. So if we could say that Cyprus is a destination where you go to, where you stay long, where you really see culture and nature and not only the beach, that could open the door to another kind of visitor that will spend money here or stay longer here because maybe it's not only the money that they pay per day but just looking at the whole trip as beneficial that might also create opportunities and and again it's just looking differently at what type of customer or visitor do we attract today and not be blinded by that one so broaden our base Yeah, and I think it all starts really with looking at yourself, like what what is Cyprus, what do you stand for, and and what kind of of visitor suits this image. Hmm? We have been in the past very much serving the customer, like we say in marketing, and the customer is always right. Well, nowadays we see that um, you also need to take care of yourself. Eh? Like, I'm a mother. If I ask my children, what, what do you want to eat? They would eat pizza every day, but I don't allow them to do so. Eh? So I also, like for myself, but you can do that for a destination too, define what is good to me and what kind of visitors are good to me. And it has to do with so much more. It also has to do with respect for the environment that they show, respect for local people. So I think... There's also a good and interesting challenge to look at tourism not only as an economical industry, but also as as a human industry where tourism can bring more than just money. And let's talk, if we may, very briefly about cruises. They are extremely unenvironmentally friendly, as far as I know, and they seem to be growing in popularity. Your thoughts on that? Well, my personal thoughts on that, uh, to be safe here, is that when we research or every every document that I read almost about cruise ships, you see that the net benefit, and I'm saying net benefit, so we take into account the cost people bring, are almost non-existing. Now I'm talking about Bruges, I'm talking about Dubrovnik, I'm talking about cities in Europe. And if they can choose which kind of visitor they would attract, I would not recommend them to continue to attract cruise tourists. Well, Venice has stopped them, hasn't it? Well, not so sure about it. I think they just asked the ships to go a bit further away from, not within the city centre, but just to go a bit further away. I'm not sure if that is the ultimate solution there. But of course, yeah, if you, you maybe cannot do it from today until tomorrow, but if you could develop a 10-year plan, if I was a European city, I would not um, define them as my customer. However, we speak of Cyprus, we speak of an island. I think the situation there is different because, yeah, it's uh, it, the access to the island is important and you only have like flights and you have boats and not necessarily cruise ships, but there are some good investments going on in like smaller uh, cruise ships or river cruises. A lot of things are happening there. So, um, But what about the environmental impact of cruise ships? Well, yeah, we've seen it in the conference a bit, eh? So, uh, and TUI is working on it. Of course, there is not so much as in air pollution, but in cruise line, I think, I don't have the exact numbers. In terms of cruise ships, I think for an island, it's, it's a different situation. I think they can bring in value because uh, these um, tourists have a stop at your island, I would just make sure that you make the best of it. So extend the time as long as possible, make sure that they really bring a visit into the city and not only do the the typical hotspots because that's creating visitor pressure then in certain areas which also like has an impact on local people. So I would be really careful and and try to make the best possible uh, experience for the cruise tourist but also I would involve my local people here in the further development of it. And that is Elke Dens, Director of Global Programmes at the Travel Foundation. Elke, thanks for your time. Thank you. Get in touch with the Cyprus News Digest by emailing cyprusnewsdigest at gmail.com.
Costas Kumis is our Deputy Minister of Tourism and he's been at the conference not only addressing it but also taking part in a round table. Costas, what did you glean from all the events that took place at the conference because there were a lot of different topics covered? What have you brought away from it? The most important fact uh, for us as Minister of Tourism is to create awareness as about uh, the impacts of the climate change to the tourist industry. Although the topic climate change is under discussion for many, many years right now, we believe that uh, the level of awareness is not so high as it should be. The impacts of the climate change are obvious already. We have seen floods all over the world uh, this summer. We're observing uh, increase in the temperature in many different countries. So we consider that uh, it is very, very important to organize a conference to give the chance to the tourist industry to get more and more information as about the threat, which is called uh, climate change. Well, uh, one of the threats that was highlighted in the program today was the increasing heat, particularly in Cyprus. And that means, surely, that it's going to impact our summer tourism because a lot of northern Europeans are saying, it's too hot, I can't stand it. Uh, let us clear us that it, it is something which is happening, not only Cyprus. At the moment, it has an effect, the tourist industry. But, uh, of course, it is something which it is in our minds that we need to take actions uh, to prevent this uh, kind of uh, circumstances. It is for that reason which we believe as uh, Ministry of Tourism that we need to take action as such, proceeding to plant trees in different areas. I'm talking about tourism areas, mainly coastal areas. It is something which we have discussed with the Ministry of Agriculture that uh, we need to take several actions to face this kind of uh, impacts. Of course, these kind of actions are very small if we take into consideration what is happening in the whole planet and especially the area of, of the Mediterranean. But it's the sum of the parts. If everybody plants course, trees, it's course, going to have an effect. Uh, everyone about, at the personal level should take action. What about the winter tourism? We've been talking for years about pushing our tourist product across more months of the year and we never seem to quite get there. It is a target which ho uh, has been set uh, by many governments, it is something which is under discussion for more than 30 years. Okay. The reasons why Cyprus never developed high numbers during the winter period are many. What I can explain you right now, what I can say right now is that this year, between the period November to February, we're expecting an increase up to 25% in comparison with the year before. It is not easy to proceed from one day to the other to a successful operation during the winter period. We need to operate our tourist product, I'm talking about the winter period, and we are in this direction. What about things like sports tourism? They need good weather to train if they're playing for European clubs, and there's a huge potential there, surely. In last year, we had around 50 uh, football clubs uh, coming to Cyprus for training. Very recently, we have approved the incentive scheme offering to, to the clubs or to the travel agencies dealing with the sports industry, the sports uh, tourism. Uh, we believe that the changes uh, which we have done will give the chance to the travel industry to bring more uh, clubs in preparation in Cyprus. It is not only the football business, it is also cycling as a sport, which is very interesting uh, for us. It is some other sports which we consider very important uh, that they can offer us more and more numbers over, over time. And what about new areas of tourism? Are you having any brainstorming Which areas, uh, which areas are you talking about? Well, I'm wondering if you've had any bright ideas that, you know, we could do a route around our medieval churches, we could do archaeological tourism. I don't know. I'm not in the business, but uh, I'm sure there are things. Honestly talking, uh, I enjoy your questions, the, uh, Rosie. Very recently, uh, I was in uh, France, and during my stay in France, I considered that uh, we should promote, we should reveal the connection between Cyprus, let's say, 
and France because we used to be basically a French colony for three centuries. And likewise Venice. We, uh, sorry? And likewise Venice. Of course, of course. The Lusignan. We never, we never design a route offering the opportunity to the visitors to see what the Lusignans did in Cyprus, how the Lusignans in general talking spend their time in Cyprus. We have history which we never revealed. Tomorrow, I have a meeting with the Deputy Minister of uh, Culture uh, to discuss these issues. It is our obligation to reveal this history and not only about the the Lusignans, we need to reveal all the aspects of our history. It is also the connection with Venus, Aphrodite. Uh, we need to get the proof. Uh, we have uh, a rich history and uh, we need to find a way to promote it more. That is our Deputy Minister of Tourism, Kostas Koumis. Katrin Mullers is the Director of Sustainability at TUI and she was talking to at that conference on tourism and sustainability and climate change. She joins us now. Katrin, I was particularly interested, you were talking about the changes that may be coming in transport. We all know that there are moves to change the fuels that aeroplanes use and possibly the routes that boats take because I know that the Copernicus project does I think map all the different currents across the oceans and it could be actually less energy intensive to take a long way round from Europe to America because you're riding on those currents. There's a lot of science in there. Do you see this coming about anytime soon? For, for me in general, transport is a very important aspect and it's one of the key aspects for, for a sustainable transformation. We, we see, especially in the airline industry, very high emissions that we as TUI want to reduce. It's very important for us to reduce these emissions and we have three key areas there. On the one hand, flying as efficient aircraft as possible to really ensure that they have no or less, less emissions. The, the next one is everything around sustainable aviation fuel that we are going to use in the future to, to reduce the, the effects further. And the last point within the airline sector is the, the use of more efficient operation. That could be on the one hand different routes, on the other hand a different way of, of flying the aircraft. That are all the aspects that are very important for us from, from, from the airline sector. In the area of cruise, we have on the, on the one hand technology with, within the ship that we are, we are going to change, like silicon painting, like, like propeller upgrades, and of course getting, getting different kind of fuels new more sustainable fuels within our ships is very important for us and the topic that you mentioned the routing is of course key for us as well to really find the the routes that are affecting the sustainability less and have really good good the the less effect on on sustainability and as efficient as possible and have no or less effect on with regard to emissions you mentioned silicone paint now is that more slippery does it exactly <laughs> exactly that that makes our ships go it, it sounds a bit strange but go smoother through 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 the water and of course by by this they are using less fuel and getting less emissions out in the air so, so it's that's, the equivalent that's... of aerodynamic drag in cars more or less exactly <laughs> What are the other things that TUI is doing that it needs to maybe up its game in terms of bringing this about as soon as possible? Let's look at hotels, for example. Exactly. In, in the hotel area, we have, we have key three elements. On the one hand, it's reduce our consumption. That means really looking into how can we operate our hotel as efficient as possible, ensuring we are consuming less, less energy for, for the different areas within the hotel. Ah, that's, that's, the, that's the first one. The second one is sourcing renewable energy and the last one is really building our own sustainability or renewable energies on, for example, hotel roofs to ensure we are, we are getting the, the renewable energy ourselves. That are the three key areas for us with regard to 
hotels and emissions. Now I seem to recall many years ago now talking about green keys to hotels and it does seem that one of the priorities for an increasing number of travellers is how well the hotel they plan to stay at or the place they plan to take their holiday is working in terms of green ideas. Do you find that with your customers? We find that with our, our customers. We have within TUI, we have a special labeling when you book a holiday so you, you can see what, what kind of hotel you have and we see people booking that but of course it's always a combination of different factors. One is of course sustainability but for our customers there are multiple factors to, to choose a special hotel so it's it's not only sustainability but of course it's it's the destination itself it's the it's how the hotel is running and so on lots lots of different points that lead in the end to a final decision. For our customers, we, we see an increasing importance of, of sustainable choices, of making sustainable choices. On our websites, we are, we are giving them the opportunity to understand which hotels are, are doing already very, very well, are certified, GSTC certified, and that helps our customers to really take a sustainable choice. That is Katrin Mullers, who is Director of Sustainability at TUI. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.